Before I hand you over to Patrick, may I say that you are all very, very welcome to my home. Because if you hadn't realised it, I'm the parish priest here. And Patrick tells me that there are a number of others who share the same discipline and profession as he does. So I consider that quite a coup to get so many of you into a vicarage. <laughs> if not into the church. And there we are. It is apparently Black Friday. And a bargain, therefore, awaits you. I will say no more and hand you over. But you are very welcome, and thank you for coming. Okay, welcome. Now, I first want to welcome Andrew Samuels, who will say a few words. Right. Um, in addition to saying a few words, I need to tell you that I'm, I'm employed sometimes as a consultant in psychoanalytic books by Routledge, and therefore I can tell you that the sales of this particular book have been astronomical. I mean, don't get too excited, that means 300 copies. <laughs> <laughs> but 300 copies in two or three weeks is extraordinary, and I think uh, Routledge are very pleased about this. Uh, at the end of these few remarks, there will be a toast, so if you don't have a glass, you're just going to have to give a salute. <laughs> In the introduction to this work, Patrick tells us that this is his final book. How omniscient of him. And maybe those words are also a kind of magical utterance against fate. Sorry for the interpretation. Still, I am glad, we are all glad, that this is not a posthumous publication. <laughs> I've had to work on two of those in my time, and it isn't much fun. <laughs> to paraphrase Donald Winnicott, Patrick would probably hope to be alive for even a posthumous publication. <laughs> Enough. This is a book full of life, vim and vigor, controversy, and personal reminiscence and confession. It is a sexy book. <laughs> if you have not yet read chapter 18, <laughs> My Time with Cancer, An Extraordinary Journey, I recommend doing it. It really is extraordinary. For this chapter alone, not apparently clinical in nature, we can summon up what the American psychoanalyst Ted Jacobs wrote in his blurb on the back of the book. This is the most important collection of papers to appear in many years. I'm especially honored to be asked to speak tonight, for I am one of the book's dedicatees to my supervisees, with whom I have learned so much, he wrote. It's clear that it was also a supervisee who intuited that he did have one more book in him, Patricia Morris, who is credited in the introduction. In supervision, Patrick is exceptionally tolerant of difference. He is that rare thing in our field, someone who knows his own mind, but is not frightened of what other minds do. We saw this in the fairly recent book by yet another dedicatee supervisee, Diana Schmuckler. This was in many ways a relational account of a supervisory process, and hence very unusual and original. But the thing I want to underscore was that the knowledge base and style of working was different in some ways from Patrick's, yet was received and recognised fully by him. I want to talk just a bit about the <coughs> radical humanity that informs Patrick's revision of what the patient brings to analysis and psychotherapy. The patient is depicted in your work, Patrick, 
not only as an individual, always an individual, but also as an agent of change and as a fount of knowledge. This is still radical in the field, wherein the fantasy of the analyst being the one supposed to know has not as yet fully abated. In his books, Patrick tells us to pay attention to the ways in which the patient reads us. His work on mistakes, maybe these days we would call them enactments, couples unpredictability and meaningfulness. Meaning comes from not knowing. You often say this. Mm -hmm. Patrick has been a brave revolutionary during his career. He has needed to be because, sorry to be blunt, there have been attempts by the establishment to settle scores with him. The thought police and worse have frequently been in action. For Patrick took on the orthodoxies and the manualizers of his day, but without ever fully severing contact with them, which would have been the far easier route. It's more difficult to stay in touch with people you're in conflict with. Mm. Hence, chapter five of the book is seminal. It's one of the best papers I've ever read. It is entitled The Emperor's New Clothes, Some Serious Problems in Psychoanalytic Training. In this chapter, we see a dissection of power that is both appropriately forensic and paradoxically warm. Warm. For Patrick understands the fragility of the powerful rather well. In this sense, when much political talk these days is of such fragility, whether in relation to men or in relation to white people, he has sniffed out something of huge importance beyond the consulting room. Jung said that every psychology is a personal confession. This is never more true than in what Patrick writes about his experiences of wild analysis by committee to use his words. In a way, what he gives us in this ex extremely important chapter is permission, permission, not incitement or license, just permission to probe the abuses of analyst neutrality alongside its uses. In the world of community politics, the idea of advocacy is simply what they do. In the therapy world, it is unusual to read of an analyst who risked the slur of losing boundaries to defend his patient when his patient was being attacked. Mm. I think Maya Angelou's words on courage are relevant to you. She wrote, courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, she says, but nothing consistently without courage. Courage doesn't exist in a vacuum, though. Patrick has managed to assemble a support team. Some are here. Others are scattered. Some are no longer with us. But at the heart of the team, we find Margaret. She is the sine qua non the without which not of the whole thing, the jewel. Coming to the end, I have been thinking why Patrick is such a rewarding person to know. He gives back, he gives back. It is ingrained in him to care and to communicate through laughter and through tears too. As Susie Orbach wrote in her blurb, it always pays to read Casement and then to reread him. Patrick and I have known each other for 35 years. We have had a lot of laughs, a lot of sadness too, a lot of illness and accident, and a lot of curries. <laughs> we here assembled now have a solemn responsibility to launch your book 
so that it manages to overcome Routledge's commitment to publishing with total discretion. <laughs> so please join me in toasting, learning along the way. To the book. To the book. To the book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, please forgive me if I stay sitting down. Uh, I didn't start sitting down at the last book launch, but I had to end up sitting down, so I think I st start here. Uh, a few thanks to begin with. Andrew is completely right when he singles out Margaret as central to all my book writing. Not only has Margaret supported me through six books, uh, the six books themselves represent 50 years of clinical work, which represent over 50,000 hours when I was not there to attend to Margaret in any shape or form because I was attending to other people. Not an easy thing for any wife to put up with, and she's still there. We've been together for 52 years, and we even made it to the book launch. <laughs> together. So, thanks to her. Thanks also to David holding for allowing us to meet in this wonderful house, which has made a completely different experience from how it would be huddled into our house. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Also, Patricia Morris, where are you? Patricia Morris. I owe her huge thanks because uh, at the end of the supervision, she came to me with supervision uh, for some time. And then she said, why have you stopped writing? And I said, I'm never going to write again. Why not? And I said, well, I, I'm not still seeing patients and without the ongoing stimulus of patients, I don't think I've got anything to say. And she then surprised me by saying, well, why don't you make a collection? Which I immediately said, I don't, I, in my opinion, I don't think collections work. They se seem to read just like a collection of papers. Well, look into it, she said. Then I had the good fortune to fall over backwards and crack a vertebra, which confined me to bed for quite a long time. So I decided I would follow Patricia's advice, and I went to bed with a computer, which I spent about 18 hours a day for at least two weeks digging into my computer and looking at what was there. And what thrilled me was that as I began to click piece things around, I began to think if I put them like this and like this, there's actually there are themes that seem to run through from one chapter to another. And I thought, it's working. So I carried on doing that. Uh, I said to Patricia, if I did end up with a manuscript, would she edit it? Certainly, she said. So seven weeks later, when she came to her next consultation, I said, 75 words, will you edit? And she immediately edited. And three weeks later, I got a contract from Mark Routledge, a finished manuscript, all ready to be turned to a book. Now, I need to explain this thing about not writing books. It's been key. I've actually not been writing books for 40 years, 39 years. It all started in 1979, the International Congress in New York, at which I was introduced to, uh, I can never remember his name, Jason Aronson, and he got it into his head that I might have a book in me, and would I please present a manuscript and he publish it. That immediately put me off completely. The idea of writing a book never occurred to me. If it had occurred to me, I was pretty sure I wouldn't want it to be published by Aronson. <laughs> so I was busy not writing a book, and I was successful in not writing a book for about three years, until two o'clock one morning, I was still not getting to sleep. And this is a totally true story. At two o'clock, suddenly, from nowhere, the phrase learning from patient, learning from a patient hit me, and my mind went into overdrive, and by half past two, I, I suddenly realized, with all the fizzing in my head, that this covered almost the central meaning of my last however many decades of work with patients. So at half past two, I woke Margaret. What's the matter? She said. <coughs> oh. she I, said <laughs> I said, I've got some terrible news. What now? She said. 
<laughs> and I said, no, it's true. I said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew that this title would not let me go until it had gone full term. Uh, I then saw Roger, what Kinson, what, what was his first name, Maui? Uh, Kinson? Warren, Warren, Warren Kinson. Warren. He used to drop in and see us. Are <coughs> you writing a book? He said, uh, Well, I might be. Have you got a title? I said, well, I have got a title, but <coughs> what, what's the title? I said to him, I will tell you the title on one condition. I mean very seriously, do use my title in any shape or form in print before I have produced what I'm going to produce for you. I promise you I will kill you. <coughs> and he said, uh, that's quite all right. My patients learn from me. <laughs> yes, yes. So... That's, that's how the first book happened. I'm not going to go through all the books like this, but what I learned out of all this was how important it was for me not to be writing a book. Because it, it maintained for me a freedom not to write. Which meant, as long as I wasn't writing a book, I didn't have any <coughs> reason to go near a publisher. And I'd heard that publishers do terrible things to authors. They expect... Uh, mm. Outlines of... What, what do you call them? Um, they, they want you to outline the book you're going to write. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it called? A synopsis? No, it's not a synopsis. Proposal? Pro uh, book, they want a book proposal uh, with uh, outline of the chapters and sample chapters and you know what you're going to do. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I wanted to have the freedom to go on not knowing what I was going to do. I had to be free not to write and free to write when the mood was with me, from the, be the belly in my, the heat in my belly. So that carried on for about three years, by the end of which it looks like it might be a book. So I asked David Tuckett, what, what do I do now? He said, oh, well, you, you find an agent. So I <coughs> found an agent who sent it to then Tavistock Publications, who would pretty dubious because they'd never ever handled a digital text before. It was the first one they'd ever had to handle. And if they took it on, they'd have to go and buy computers. Which <laughs> <laughs> other people got, but they weren't going to. So, uh, and they also didn't read the, the manuscript. So they returned it unread. And David thought it was not quite right. So he got hold of somebody uh, and said, I think we should at least read the text. And they did. And it then turned into book that's now in 21 languages, largely thanks to David for rescuing it. And so I continue not to be writing books until this very last one. And then Patricia Morris upset the apple cart by suggesting I might do this collection thing. So when I found it was beginning to work uh, as a book and not just a collection, I got rather excited. And so I felt driven along. And I've never worked so hard, never written so productively as I did in this thing. And in seven weeks, we got a book. But it had to be not a book until <laughs> it's ready to go near a publisher. So that's how I, I get by by not writing books. <laughs> so there we go. Um, <coughs> just a few things since then. Uh, I happened to mention to somebody a couple of weeks ago uh, that and it's true that we've got 30 journals waiting to review it. And this person misheard me and said, but how extraordinary, how can you possibly know 30 generals? <laughs> <laughs> and, and why would generals want to re re review your book? So that's that. And then finally this week, I had an extraordinary thing on Facebook. And I don't know whether you have it on your iPhone, but my iPhone has a robot secretary somewhere in the box that scans all the emails and communications and then suggests how I should reply. I don't <laughs> like people writing my replies, particularly on this occasion, because the over-the-top comment went like this, congratulations on your latest book. I'm quite sure it would be at, at least as wonderful as all the other books you've written. And the first reply suggested was, Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, even I would not be like that. <laughs> like that. So here we are. 
Um, thank you, Andrew, for all you said. Thank you, Patricia. And not least, Nelly. It, where's Nelly? Oh, hello, Patrick. Nelly, come, come forward. Uh, Nelly Dimitrovna. If I got it right. Nearly. Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Nelly started the whole thing actually because she had a party on the corner in Estelle Road. And we a came to it. <laughs> some wine on tables and we, we joined her. Yeah. And that's where I met Patricia Morris. So Nelly introduced me to Patricia Morris. Patricia Morris persuaded me come off my high horse and, and consider that uh, collections can work. So th we did that. Then we got, uh, the book was accepted without any other nonsense that part of the recyclers throw on first authors. And then the cover. And Routledge said, oh, we'll, we'll do the cover. Uh, they showed me two million covers. And they said, oh, just working on learning along the way, you just want to look for Sunless Wending Road or Sunless Pass, you, you find millions of them. All so boring. And I wanted them to consider using Nelly. And so I said, look, Nelly has done some wonderful work and here's an example of her work. And they said, look no further, that's ideal for this book. <laughs> and Nelly is very generously given us that. Mm. My pleasure, Patrick. It's, um I'm grateful to you and Margaret for teaching me wisdom. <laughs> so you've made a wonderful book, all of you, between you. Thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone wants to buy a copy, I have to do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> Black Friday.